I think we'll start this uh, afternoon session and uh, it's uh, reducing risk in coronary artery bypass grafting. And the first presentation is going to be from uh, Professor Arai from Tokyo and he's going to talk about the use of intraoperative ultrasound, quality assessment and surgical guidance to improve coronary artery bypass grafting outcomes. Good afternoon, everybody. It's my great honor to be invited in this special uh, meetings and have an opportunity to make, make a presentation. So my talk this afternoon is an interoperative ultrasound quality assessment and surgical guidance to improve cabbage outcome. So what is required for high quality cabbage is first thing important is a epiotic ultrasonography. If stroke happens uh, at the time of the cabbage, the outcome of the patient is, is so bad. So we have to avoid stroke. And uh, this kind of things might happen if the, if the patient ascending aorta is so much atherosclerotic, if you put the side cramping, you got the lots of plaques from the ascending aorta, this is the source of the stroke. We, we definitely have to prevent this kind of phenomenon. So what is the best technique to detect ascending aortic atheroma interoperatively? There is some kind of limitation of manual palpation and transesophageal echocardiographies. Actually, manual palpation, soft plaque can never be palpated. And the TEE visualization is limited owing to the interposition of the left mainstream bronx between the esophagus and the aorta. So, Apiotic ultrasonography is the most sensitive, practical, and the safest of these techniques to detect ascending aortic atheroma in cardiac surgical patients. So this is my routine practice of using how I apply apiotic scanning. So for the proximal ascending aorta, this, uh, I, I can decide where to put the proximal anastomosis. And the mid-ascending aorta, if I put a patient on, on bypass, where to cross cramp or where to put the side cramp. And for the distal aorta, you, you can see the safe, safest portion for the cannulation. And uh, this is a, a, a one, one typical case of the calcified aortic wall. Okay, you can detect the calcification by plain CT, and, but you can more precisely recognize the border between the normal wall and the classified aortic wall. And uh, this kind of patient, there, were, there is a protruding soft plaque at the uh, posterior wall of the aorta. So maybe you can suspect there is something wrong by plain CT, but it's not sure. But this kind of patient, for you can touch the anterior wall of the aorta, but if you cross cramp the aorta, you get a bad result of the stroke of the patient. And how about this? Second atheromatous intima, more than four millimeter. So it's plain CT or manual palpation cannot show wall thickness, but this is a kind of dangerous case if you, if you touch the aorta. And this is the most interesting case of the high risk of stroke due to, if, if you put a patient, patient on the CPV and, I'm sorry, it's a, the movie is stopping. But second intima and the soft plaque is a posterior wall and there is a mobile plaque in the, in the origin of the innominate artery. For this kind of cases, non-touch aortic technique using off pump is the most desirable strategy to put a bypass. So this is a flow chart of a proposed treatment approach for uh, preventing uh, stroke during isolated cabbage. So first of all, you, you should do a routine epiaortic ultrasound. And then if the aortic wall is normal, you can do anything, put a bypass or a cross cramp, a side cramp is okay. But if you find a kind of soft plaque posterior wall of the aorta, off pump or on pump beating heart surgery, but you, you only can touch the, uh, the an uh, anterior wall of the aorta. For this kind of uh, diffusely uh, diseased uh, aorta, definitely you have to put this, uh, you have to do off cap 
and don't touch our ta. Or if you find any hot spot for a safe portion, you can put a proximal anastomosis using a, a proximal anastomotic assist device like Enclos 2 or heart, uh, heart stream. So second thing important is a transit time flow measurement after you construct a, a graft. So this is recommended by the guideline by ESC, ESCTS 2018, uh, the class 2A. So this is one of the typical case of after I put the gastroepiploic artery to the posterior descending arteries, so 91 millimeter per minute, PI 2.1, diastolic feeling 76%, it's very satisfactory. And then I put another another graft on on the more distally, so uh, between two graft I could I could measure the um, flow 30, 33 minutes. And it's satisfactory, and after the operation we we routinely perform uh, before the discharge we routinely perform a chin angiogram and the same uh, we 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 already conf uh, have a confidence during the operation this kind of result m must be happen. So right now, interoperative graft flow evaluation by transit time flow measurement is a routine manner in Japan, routine, almost routine. Almost, almost every institute uh, do this kind of thing because we got a reimbursement for each case. If, if we perform a flow measurement for each case, we, we got a 25,000 yen is a today ratio. I, I calculated a 7,100 Thai bars. So for each case you, you get from the government. So this is pushing the safetyness of the patient all over the Japan. Okay, so how we, uh, in, we interpret it. So mean flow and the prostatile pretty index and the diastolic feeling pattern, flow is a flow. But the prostatile index is a kind of indication of the resistance of the, of the graft. If it's uh, less than five, it's okay. If it's more than five, you have some stenosis at, at the time, you might have some stenosis at, at the portion of the anastomosis. And basically the diastolic feeling is usually more than 50. But for the left coronary arteries, it usually 60 or 70, but, but sometimes right coronary artery side, maybe around 50 kind of things. So in, in combination of, of these three numbers, you can imagine uh, how, whether something wrong or not for my graft. So this is the, the typical case of the, the circumflex anastomosis 142, bunch of flow and PI 1.7, diastrophing 60%, no problem at all. But if you find this kind of numbers, only two milliliter per minute, after you anastomose the Rita 2 LED, PI 12 and the diastolic feeling only 6% must be bad. So actually it, the graft was occluded. So need revision. If you revise it properly, you can get a nice number of 49, PI 1.2, diastolic feeling 65%. The upper part is a kinked graft of the uh, anastomose the radial artery to circumflex, the very bad flow and the PI is very high, but you, if you release the kinking, the flow recovers nicely. So how do you think about this kind of typical case? So I anastomose saphenous vein graft to right coronary artery of segment three. The flow was 27 milliliter per minute. I already anastomosed the proximal part. But I wanted to anastomose the second sequential anastomosis. I left some part of the saphenous vein graft and clamped at the end of the saphenous vein. But the PI was 5.3. So mm, PI 5.3 is, is not acceptable. But so maybe stenotic or not. So I, I changed it a little bit for the measurement. Then PI returned 3.4. It's satisfactory. What I have done was uh, I changed the clamping portion of the saphenous vein graft. So because the left one, the distal part of the saphenous vein graft became a kind of a compliance chamber and so it, it, it tells you uh, a little bit wrong number. But if you properly uh, clamp just after the anastomosis, 
then you got a nice number. This is a one of the trick of, in case of you measuring this kind of situation. So coronary occlusion test. So basically I, I do, for, uh, especially for the anastomosis to Rita 2 LAD. So in this particular case, Rita 2 LAD, 20 millimeter per minute, okay, PI 1.4, diastolic thing, 64%, it must be okay, yes? And if I make a, some kind of occlusion for the distal, the flow down the eight millimeter per minute, so it's functionally normal. And also if I uh, make an occlusion for the proximally, the flow increases. So this, this is a kind of, uh, it, this kind of phenomenon is it's normal. So it, if you find this kind of phenomenon, so the, the graft must be uh, uh, functionally normal. And, but, but how about this? So this is a case of the uh, right uh, and the radial artery composite graft to posterior lateral branches. Flow was nine millimeter per minute. PI 3.0, okay, diastolic thing 74%. Flow is not satisfactory. So I made a proximal occlusion, occlusion test and the flow increased up to 12 millimeter per minute, but still not so, not satisfactory, no, less than 50 minute. minute. Mm, I still have a, um, can't have a confidence in, the, in this kind of situation. And how about this? So this is a case of the, uh, uh, definitely this, uh, this is a uh, competitive flow. And for the, uh, so make a, make a occlusion test, but still the flow is seven, seven milliliter per minute. So I, I can't get confidence of this kind of cases. So if the graft flow is uh, less than 10 milliliter and the PI is more than five or that's the feeling is less than 50%, this graft may need a revision. But there is some suboptimal cases, is uh, like PI between three to five and diastolic feeling um, a little bit less than 50%, and the flow is between 10 to 40 millimeter per minute. So this is a marginal suboptimal graft. So you you can't have a confidence only the information by transit inflammatory. So if something's wrong. If something wrong, we have to do something, okay? Definitely something wrong. So th then we, we have to check by using a high resolution epicardial ultrasonography, which is very effective too. So how I apply this? So first, uh, the probe is very, very small. You can, you can put any, anywhere on the heart, any surface of the heart easily. And uh, before starting the, uh, the anastomosis, you, I scan the target coronary artery. So in this portion, the sinangiogram shows maybe intramyocardium, but, but if, I, if I scan it, I can find the depth of the coronary artery. And this portion, I can recognize where the septal perforator is. And this portion, so there is a calcium plaque on the distally. So this kind of information you can get at the, at the time of the operation. And this is a typical case of embedded coronary artery. So, so you, you, you can avoid unnecessary dissection. And in this case, intramyocardial LAD, if you, if you make a this dissection of this part, you might have a accidental right ventricular rupture. So, so for the safetyness of the uh, decision making for which part of the coronary artery you anastomose, this is very important. And after the anastomosis, you can see the length of anastomosis and the caliber of LAD or liter. And uh, if you compare the different modality, it, uh, you can recognize how ECAS shows much, much, much better pictures. So this is a uh, long calcified region. So I, I, I scan step by step from pre proximal to distal, and then I imagine all the pictures of the coronary artery. Then finally I, came, I decided I, I have to make a little bit longer incision and uh, on, on the patch plastic. After the, after the procedure, 
I check it. The heel position is nicely opened, overriding the calcium portion, and uh, the toe portion is okay, nicely. So I, I can leave the operating theater with definite confidence of the patency of the graft. How about this case? This case is a 79-year-old male opcap. So this is a severe stenosis at the proximal portion of the LAD, and there is a first septal branch, and this is, there is another suspicious portion. So I scanned it, this, this part, okay, from the proximally from this portion is an intermyocardium. And there is an overriding uh, calcium plaque over there, and the distal portion is okay. This is a real picture during the operation, if you can compare the real picture and the ultrasonic pictures. So definitely this is, a, in the center of the incision, there is a calcium plaque over there and the distal part is okay. So I actually, I put the long only patch plasty. So three steps to evaluate anastomosis. First, you perform transitive fluorometry. In this particular case, 78 millimeter per is very satisfactory. PI 1.5, diastolic filling 75%. Maybe you don't have to do uh, perform a, uh, ECAS, but if, but yeah, I, if you perform ECAS, you can more, you can get mu much more confidence. So uh, actually, the graft is overriding the calcium plaque. And uh, finally, before the discharge, we perform a kind of postoperative CAG, and it shows uh, not only the distally, but also proximally, the graft is satisfactory perfusing of all the LED areas. So, this, this is a slide I, I showed previously. It's a occlusion, even occlusion test, it shows a flow only 12 millimeter per minute. So in this kind of case, I perform, I definitely perform a, a ECAS, a epicardial ultrasound scanning. So it shows a nicely patent anastomosis. So if, if I stop the mo move it at the systolic portion, it's a red, flow is reversal flow from the coronary, and for the diastolic, it, it's coming distally. So, so this kind of uh, uh, color flow mapping shows that not only the patency of the graft, but the real physiology of the graft. For uh, This is a tips for better visualization on beating heart. So basically, I recommend you to use a sonar, sonar pad uh, between the surface of the heart and the Pro, uh, the ECAS probe, but, but, but I often use uh, this kind of integrated probe. What kind of is, uh, I cut the middle finger of the globe and cut the small piece of the sonar pad and put it in, and with the uh, setting or the jerry, make a ligation and make a, this kind of integrated probe. And with, with this technique, you can put the probe anywhere on the heart, even the posterior wall or the lateral wall. So this is a typical case of the I check the evaluation of the anastomosis, of the sequential graft for the PL1 and the PL2. So this uh, scanning, uh, ultrasonic scan is useful, not only for the anastomosis, but also the detection of the internal thoracic artery. So after the anastomosis, this looks okay by eyeball sighting, but the flow was marginal, 10 milliliter per minute, PI is okay, and the diastolic filling is 65%. So then I perform uh, ECAS, then I, I could find the dissection at the site of the anastomosis, dissection of the litter. So if, if you see the transverse scanning, it's almost like a dissection of the aorta. So because the uh, the length of the dissection is limited, only only few within few centimeters. So we revised anastomosis and then get real nice flow. So tips of, of to obtain better images. So first thing is uh, stabilize the target vessel, especially on, in case of the op cap, and then obtain adequate contact with the target lesion enough jelly, preferably with sonar pad, and be patient. 
sometimes it takes time, actually. When longitudinal view is not satisfactory, take transverse view and reconstruct the images in your brain. So recently, the request to study uh, was published by J J J J JTC Reyes. Uh, it, it's a study of the how much influence uh, have kind of a combination of transit time photometry and uh, uh, ultrasonic scanning makes changes the uh, surgical procedure. So with these two modalities, for the, it was performed in several international centers. So any surgical change was happened in the 25% of the patient. And for the coronary artery, 22% of the patients, the surgeon that changed their strategy. So for the optimizing intraoperative decision during cabbage using high resolution ECAS prior to anastomosis, target coronary artery, internal cardial, whether the calcification or adequate cali caliber or aortic wall, is it okay, calcified or soft plaque or wall thickness and anastomotic configuration, is it good or not? And ITA is okay. This kind of, of information you can get in interoperatively. Finally, I, I, uh, so after we introduced this technique, so we got a real nice graft patency comparing to the, the literature. We are very satisfactory uh, using this uh, strategy. So finally, I'd like to show, uh, introduce some usefulness and potential efficacy in other cardiac procedures. So this is a case of the emergency case of acute aortic dissection. For the, pre for the CTs, you can suspect the, the calcification of the LAD and the RCA. Maybe some stenosis happens, but you don't have a time to perform a angiogram. So during the operation, just scan it. So you, I, I could find the actual stenosis in LAD region. So I put a, I put a emergency graft to LAD. But when, when I scan the right coronary artery, so it, it's actually calcified, but it's patent. So it, we, we, you don't need to put the graft on it. And this is another, another interesting case of the, it, it's a HOCM patient, the SAM and the peak pressure gradient to 69. So I have to do a myectomy for this kind of patient. So I, I actually performed myectomy in the guided by this uh, ultrasonic probe. So during the operation, I measured the, the thickness of the, of the uh, septal wall by using this probe. And then I, I cut a little bit, and then I performed the uh, ultrasonic assessment. Still enough mass. So, so I cut additional, additional incision to the myocardium because I am I'm not expert of this kind of, of diseases. So I, I can't do like a Dr. Schaff doing, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a magic, he cut, cut all, but I can't do it. So I, I step by step, I check the thickness of the myocardium and then finally find it. Okay, this is the final, final portion, I get the thickness. Then after the operation, we, we found only eight millimeter of the pr pressure gradient and the sum disappeared. So with this probe, you can be sharp. So you can be sharp. <laughs> this is very useful. So ultrasonic interoperative surgical guidance and quality assessment. Nobody operates submarine without using ultrasonic. Thank you very much. And come to Tokyo this December. Th thank you very much, Dr. Rai. That's a pretty convincing argument for everyone to have one of those probes. Questions? Uh, uh, good afternoon, sir, for your nice yeah. presentation. Uh, just two or three comments. Uh, for the HOCM surgery, uh, we don't have the probe which you have. So what we are doing is we are using the transesophageal echocardiography probe and get it inside the heart and use it for uh, seeing the muscle dissection mask. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> that's one. Yeah. Second uh, thing I want to ask is, 
you do a TTFM for all cases, right? So you do a Lima to LED first. Yes, uh, basically Lima to LED first, but if there is a totally occluded right coronary artery and some critical stenosis for the left LED, I start right coronary artery and a small cell first, and then start perfusing, and and then as the next step, I I, I do a anastomose LED. And suppose you have a diagonal, a big diagonal, which angiographically looks like an occluded 70, 60, 70 percent lesion, uh, and you put a separate graft to the diagonal, and yeah. say, a and again, if you do a TTFM of the Lima to LED, and if the PI goes up. Ah, uh -huh, you mean a reversal flow of the. Uh, an independent graft to a diagonal with a radial or a vein is always going to have much greater yeah. flow than the Lima to LED at that time. Mm -hmm. So what will be your uh, uh, action uh, to, this, to increase this Lima to LED flow? Because otherwise, at times, this can give a string sign to the Lima. I'm not, I'm not sure. I, I leave it alone. If I put a, such kind of, already put a, such kind of gra gra graft, so it, it's, okay, you, sh you should perform more, you should um, perform FFR uh, preoperatively in this kind of case. So then if it looks like a mild stenosis for the LAD, it, it might be not, not so strict and a stenosis. But, but anyway, pro probably I, I put two grafts and, and uh, maybe uh, instead of a substance being graft, I, I use a, a, a radial artery or other small, small caliber for the diagonal. Then maybe you can, you can prevent this kind of phenomenon. And the third question is in say grade three aort ascending aortic uh, lesions in which you have a circumferential area and you are planning for an off pump CABG. Yeah. And uh, suppose uh, you need to go on pump. Uh, what will be your cannulation site, if required? Okay, if it necessary, put a subclavian artery and also maybe some femoral artery, divides the flow, N not only, not one inflow, but sometimes both of the subclavian artery, but uh, I, I definitely have to avoid ascending out. So, so it can happen for in case of the aortic surgery, or the barber surgery. Yes. So I divide the flow in that kind of case, avoid the can direct cannulation to the ascending aorta. Okay, thank you. In, in that situation, uh, would you probe the arch, the proximal arch? And if that was clear, would you be happy to cannulate there? Will the, the probe give you that information? It should, shouldn't it? You can use it in the aortic arch. Aortic Ah, you mean the cannulation to the aortic arch? No. The ultrasound to look at the, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. the ascending aorta is diseased. Diseased. And you look at the arch and see whether that's possible to cannulate there. Yeah, it, it can be possible. So uh, we, we can scan a anywhere on the, on the aorta. Yeah. So you, your question is that if the ascending aorta is bad, but if, you, if I scan the, ascend, uh, the arch aorta, yes. if it's okay, yes. and put the probe, uh, okay. the cannulation. Yeah, it, it's definitely okay, but but usually I prefer to put a sub, subgravium artery in that kind of situation. And is there would the <coughs> is the coronary ultrasound going to replace your fr flow probe measurement? Do you think, or is it not specific enough to give you an idea of flow? Yeah, you mean uh, for the transit TTFM shows a number of the flow, but uh, the probe for the, for the color, color flow mapping, it doesn't show the number of, yes. the, of the flow. Yes, yeah. No, it's very, uh, identifying the intramyocardial artery is very important because uh, uh, if you don't have that opportunity or, or option, then uh, what's commonly done is to graft the vessel well down where it's a lot smaller, which is suboptimal, or to try and pass a probe back up the artery and locate it up high in the fat or in the myocardium there. But the technique uh, that I've used is if you feel up high on the LAD, you will feel usually calcific disease right up high next to the pulmonary artery. And then you can follow that down and then cut over the calcific disease and then just keep going distally until you expose the artery 
right. uh, where it's healthy, and uh, even if it's intramyocardial. So uh, uh, occasionally, if you get into the right ventricle, you can usually repair it quite easily and safely uh, underneath the artery itself. So, so that's another way to identify it. Yeah. I always impress that Professor Rides every time presentation you have a new pictures. <laughs> As uh, Dr. Gardner mentioned, I use it to uh, evaluate uh, the more broader area of the aorta, especially ascending, it's not a good quality. Also, we have more and more diffuse disease, a calcified bad target. I think this uh, ECAS getting more and more variable in the modern surgery. So I think the accuracy has been changed a lot since that advent of this. And uh, I'm going to enjoy your next presentation. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Tokyo, maybe. Thank you, very, Thank you much. very much. Thanks very much. So next presenter is uh, Michael Gardner. Coach moderator of this session and his his title is a uh, skeletonization of IMA rationales and technique so are you ready for presentation or not okay you should you should bring your Actually, after I started to use uh, interoperative ultrasonography scanning, I, it, I, it is indispensable to, so I can't do operation without that kind of uh, echo, echo scanning. So, and it can be applicable in any, any situation of the cardiac surgery, even, uh, even uh, arch art, uh, uh, aortic surgery and barbara surgery. It's quite effective. So it looks like Is that right? Okay. This talk Nick, is uh, about skeletonization of the IMA rationale and technique. I think if you listen to uh, Dr. Petoulis' presentation this morning, uh, he gave some an excellent talk on skeletonization and the rationale of using it. So that's, the, that's uh, if we look at uh, a pedicled IMA graft, uh, which is the traditional way to take the IMA down uh, in the early days of uh, coronary surgery and still is for many, many surgeons who have been very reticent or reluctant to change to a skeletonized technique. And here's the, a skeletonized artery. A lot of people might tell you they skeletonize it, but they say they take it down with just a little bit of tissue from the chest wall plus the veins and still think that's skeletonized. But this is a, a true skeletonization. It doesn't mean you strip the adventitia off the vessel, but you try and keep that layer there. You may have a little bit of fat on it, but that doesn't matter. But the important thing to, to note there is that the pleura is intact and it's obviously got a small hole in it somewhere but basically it's intact and that patient won't need to have a pleural drain put in. So what are the advantages of skeletonization compared to the pedicle IMA? Well the versatility to start with is we know we're in the era of uh, increasing uh, arterial revascularization and certainly this is a much more versatile graft. It's longer, you get larger flow in it, it's larger, increased free flow, and uh, there's less trauma to the chest wall. And there's reduced evidence of reduced sternal wound complications. And importantly, you can keep the pleura intact in a high proportion of the patients, not everyone, but for uh, a, high, a high proportion. So some of the evidence there, sternal vascularity, it's been demonstrated quite clearly that uh, skeletonizing the IMA results in less reduction 
uh, or less interference to the sternal vascularity. There's also uh, low incidence sternal wound complications and that's accentuated in diabetic patients and the elderly. And certainly we know that in bilateral pedicle, bilateral internal mammary artery grafts are associated with a higher incidence of external wound infection and particularly in diabetics in the elderly and this is reduced if you skeletonize both internal mammaries. And so there's evidence there too, uh, this is a, uh, a, uh, a multi-study uh, that was uh, a meta-analysis performed uh, uh, by Dai which demonstrated and supported those statements I've just made. Uh, the other thing that's interesting was this paper by uh, Bonacci, Bonacci where he compared three groups of patients, 299 total. So he had one group that had a skeletonized IMA and the pleura was left intact. Another group where the pleura was opened after skeletonizing it and the other one where a pedicled IMA graft was done. And he, he could show in this study that uh, that there was significant reduction in, uh, in respiratory complications, ventilation times, and the necessity of uh, pleural or, the, or likelihood of pleural effusions, and particularly bloody pleural effusions, if you kept the pleura intact. And there were obvious advantages here. The thing is, if you do keep it intact, you don't need the pleural to uh, drain the pleural space. And that's an advantage for the patient in terms of uh, getting a pleural infusion uh, and uh, the discomfort of having a drain in the pleural space. So what are the disadvantages? Well, some of the arguments used against skeletonization that I've heard, uh, because I've been a, a long-term supporter of this, in fact, it started with us, and, and Dr. Fayez would remember this, we were uh, getting, uh, Dr. Jansen came to Australia in 1997 and uh, he was one of the pioneers of off-pump surgery in Europe and we had a live case, triple vessel uh, arterial graft case that he was going to do for us and we were videoing it up to our conference in Noosa and I said to him that uh, uh, no need to worry about the IMAs, I'll get uh, one of our junior surgeons or uh, some of the registrars to take the IMAs down for you and then you can... He said, no, no, thanks. I'll, uh, he said, I want to take them down myself. So I watched him do it and he skeletonized them beautifully. And ever since that time, I started doing it and uh, uh, to the point that I, I didn't know how to take down a pedicle graft after some time through always the skeletonized technique. So, so some of the arguments used against it are the technical harvest time factors implications for training, is it more easily damaged? What about the patency? And I think, I think we diffused those problems this morning in that the patency has not been shown to be inferior. Uh, the long-term uh, patency rate is satisfactory and uh, the implications regarding training, I think, can be easily overcome. After all, if that's the best procedure to do, then that's the procedure we need to be teaching our trainees. And just a reminder of the anatomy, that's from Gray's Anatomy, only to point out to you, if you look up the top, you've got the phrenic nerve, usually runs in front of the IMA, right at the very top of the thorax. And that's something you bear in mind because the last thing you want to do is have a traction injury of the phrenic nerve uh, and produce a uh, paralyzed hemidiaphragm. Even if it's uh, transitory, it's still of great inconvenience and morbidity to the patient if they've got one. So we do take the mammary high up and divide all these branch vessels. So what's the technique? Uh, well, we use a uh, internal mammary artery retractor, peel back the pleura, try to keep it intact, expose the artery the full length by opening up the endothoracic fascia and muscle with very fine tipped long scissors. Tease away the veins and the fat exposing the arterial branches. Clip and divide the branches leaving a cuff long enough, careful not to compromise the IMA lumen and not too short that uh, there's an issue with the clip coming off inadvertently. Mobilise all the way up, dividing all the branches. Protect that phrenic nerve, be aware of it. And uh, 
Once it's down and the patient's heparinized, you can dilute it with, uh, uh, divide it and divide it, uh, dilute it with the pavarine. And, uh, and subsequently uh, uh, develop a, an extra pleural gutter in the mediastinum and bring it through a pericardial window. On the right side, of course, there are other alternatives to where you're going to bring that, that, uh, that pedicled uh, skeletonized IMA. So here's the retractor that's used. It's a real track or IMA retractor, we call it. It's in there. You can see the patient's now been, uh, the table's elevated, the toe roll to the left-hand side. You can see the pleura is intact. These are the type of scissors, long handled, very fine tipped scissors, and you can use those to open the muscle endothoracic fascia along the full length of the IMA uh, without damaging it. I, I used to use uh, this ancient instrument here that few people probably don't even recognize now, but that's a foot operated uh, diathermy uh, tip. And uh, uh, it was very, very handy instrument for dissecting around the branches and teasing away the fat and the, and the vein. And uh, I found it very useful. So here we see uh, in the, the artery exposed. Uh, uh, here it is, a branch being prepared. You can see the gutter that's left behind. I mean, it's, it's neat, it's small. You can understand why there's less devascularization of the chest wall. No big diathermy burns along it. Um, and with those branches, you can see those two clips there, and that's a nice long pedicle. It's not going to compromise the IMA. And it's a nice long pedicle, so you can you'll have a nice stump, and the clip is uh, very unlikely to uh, to come off or give you problems. Up high, that's the uh, pericardiophrenic branch. Um, that doesn't seem to be have any issues with the di with the diaphragm uh, if it's divided. And of course, we go right up to the top and divide that large first of the costal branch. Make the tunnel or, uh, through the mediastinum extra pleurally and bring it through a fenestration of the pericardium. And there it sits. And of course, you see, you get a very beautiful long conduit. And you can understand its versatility. For example, if you look at that, easily cut the terminal section off, join it in as a Y higher up, and you can immediately graft two of your anterior wall vessels. So just a few replications, that's a case in point. Uh, you can do them off pump, obviously. Uh, uh, here's a circumflex graft that's been, uh, or a graft right IMA brought through the transverse sinus onto the circumflex, as the Dr. Tilda showed. And of course, in the era of uh, multiple arterial grafting, the radial has now become virtually routine. Um, and. Uh, can be used in all sorts of ways. Here we've got two, one radial off the side as a wire graft, another piece of radial off it as another wire graft below. So all sorts of combinations. Uh, there's radial off uh, uh, one side of uh, uh, one IMA, and then the other one can be used in whatever whatever direction you've decided. So the, there's all sort of options that you can do with this, and uh, it's. Uh, it's, here's a case here that using the right IMA to get to the right system and using a, uh, a radial to join into that. Usually bevel both, to do the join, beveling both ends, both the radial and uh, the IMA with a, a beveled anastomosis. Uh, this is a patient with a uh, atherosclerotic aorta that needed a, a quite a significant number of grafts. The radials were not satisfactory, so we used... Uh, the two mammaries is inflow and um, saponous vein for the five grafts that formed off pump. So in summary, the versatility of a skeletonized graft facilitates multiple arterial grafting. And as we know, bi bilateral internal mammary artery grafting is becoming almost routine. Uh, there's certainly reduced sternal wound complications, particularly in diabetics and the elderly. I don't think there's any disadvantages uh, and I think skeletonization of the IMA should be routine and importantly try to keep the pleura intact because I think it reduces morbidity in that early period for the patient. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Well, there are precisely the, the advantage of the skeletonization technique and also the technical issues. So, uh, doc Dr. Yokoyama, please. Yes. Thank you very much for your beautiful presentation. And uh, maybe uh, harvesting IMA is the uh, job for the young surgeon in your country, right? Uh, has been, yes, in part. In part? Yeah, I mean, it depends on your type of practice. Okay. Uh, for uh, patients in the private hospital, obviously, or private pa or intermediate patients in the hospital, then, uh, then the, surgeon would, the surgeon would take those arteries down. And uh, so, yes, we, the trainees would be okay. taught how to do this. Uh, one has to be very patient. And uh, it's one of the reasons that, that uh, uh, surgeons will give you for not changing from the pedicle IMA. Mm -hmm. But I think if you do it bit by bit, and you don't have to stand there for an hour and a half while he takes a whole lot down, he can do it a little bit at a time until he gets proficiency with it. Yeah. Well, in Japan, um, the uh, harvesting uh, IMA idea is uh, mainly a uh, job for the young surgeon. And uh, in Japan, we have done the uh, nationwide survey uh, for the young surgeon and the, how they are trained, how they uh, um, have a trouble in uh, IDA harvesting. And the f we found that 90% of the residents experience uh, uh, trouble when they harvesting IDA. I, IDA. The first thing is um, dissection of the IDA. And second problem is uh, branch injury uh, with IDA breeding. So that's a two big problem. Hmm. So how do you teach the young surgeon avoid or prevent or manage these two big bad things? Well, I think, it, I think you raise a very good point and that's very important because the last we, thing we want is for an IMA to be damaged and the takedown are not able to be used and uh, that's certainly uh, uh, a disadvantage that uh, any degree of skeleton, you know, you can't support skeletonization in that situation. Look, I think uh, that it's something that uh, can be taught uh, in bits, I would think, and, um, and that is that you might have them start off at the lower end to start with, just to do a small amount, show them how to, how to get the vein off, show them how to expose the artery, mm -hmm. uh, how to get the veins off, how to do a couple of branches at the bottom, mm -hmm. and just uh, it'd be uh, you know, a training in progress. They're not going to learn in, in, it'll have to be bit by bit over time. Um, but do we say, well, it's too dangerous, we're just going to have to use the pedicle IMA? I mean, I suppose if you're just doing a, a, an IMA to the LAD, then uh, your argument's a very strong one for doing a pedicle graft, I would think. Uh, yeah. Well, thank you very much. Uh, you can help us a lot. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, good, good afternoon, sir. It's a nice lecture. Just want to ask about your strategy in cases of uh, aberrant or a stuck lima or a patient who has received a radiotherapy on the left side for a CO let's say, and what will be your strategy for those patients? Yeah, um, you're testing my memory now. Uh, well, I think, uh, I think you've, got, you've got some issues here because obviously there's the issue of uh, a chest wall that's, that's, you know, got potentially potential problems with devascularization. I, I would still uh, take the artery down and have a look at it and uh, try and do it with a skeletonized approach. Uh, I think that's less traumatic to the chest wall, um, uh, minim less interference with vascularity. Uh, you'll just have to make an assessment of that conduit once you've at least got part of it down and see what the, what the size and the flow is and how it responds to uh, to dilatation, so, uh, uh, but I, uh, you, as I say, you've tested my memory. I can't, uh, I can't recall actually 
uh, particular instance, although there were, but I can't, can't remember exactly what we did. Yeah. Thank you. Any other question? So, so you, you don't use a harmonic scalpel for the hub skeletonization harvest, harmonic, ultrasonic harmonic scalpel. You only use uh, scissors and the clips. Yes, and, and that, that diathermy tip as the dissecting instrument. So I would cut over the artery, expose it, and then I would start teasing away with the diatherm, with that, not, not putting the foot on the, that's an old foot pedal diathermy that no one seems to use these days, but it was a very handy instrument for doing the dissection and just teasing away the fat and the tissues around it and exposing the branches and then putting the clips uh -huh. on the branches, cut it and then keep moving along down the artery towards the top of the chest. Yeah. And do you sometimes make a triple branches for the composite graft? I saw yeah, one of the pictures, it's uh, not a uh, Y graft, but the tri triple branches. Yeah, that, well, I think that was two, yeah. two pieces of radial coming off uh, the, the left internal mammary. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, it, it just happened on that patient, I think, must have had three good sized vessels across the anterior wall, a couple of big diagonals, maybe the LAD was small, um, and so that, yeah, we used those three uh -huh. to, to revascularize the anterior wall. Yeah. Anyway, arterial, arterial graft, it's, yeah. a, it's the best thing. Okay. I agree, thank you very much. <laughs> so next presenter is uh, Dr. Nutapon from uh, Lampang Hospital. His title is a safe op cab for poor left ventricles, lampan experience. Are you ready for the presentation? Good afternoon. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Rai and Professor Gardner, for keep supporting me all the time, many years from my setup of my new unit in Lampang Hospital. And also, I would like to ask uh, to say thank you to uh, Japanese Association of Thoracic Surgery that keeps supporting me the, the way I progress my outcome from my early experience. Actually, I am not prepared to talk in this topic because of uh, Japanese. Prof uh, Chinese professor did not come, that's all. So this is, uh, no. this is my region, that's where I stay, close to Chiang Mai. You can drive a car about one and a half hours, but we share the same culture like in, Thai, like in Chiang Mai. Uh, as we all know that CV11 dysfunction is an independent predictor for operative mortality in the patient who's going to do cabbage. Generally, off-pump approach is considered to be technically demanding. So most of the surgeons are afraid of off pump crash, incomplete revascularization of poor quality of surgery. Not to mention off-pump 11 dysfunction in the situations in Thailand, which is the number of off-pump is not so high. However, I would like to touch a little bit about the evidence I think uh, most of the attendees got the evidence from the previous uh, professor in the morning. I will show you a bit. Start with these uh, papers from Italy by Professor Massimo Lemma. He, he did uh, papers called on and off pump. And uh, he included the patients who have the high risk patient with Euro score more than six and divided into two arms, 200 in each arm. and. Finally, we have the conclusion with the interim analysis that often reduce early mortality and morbidity in high-risk patients. Another one from Professor Kovalevsky in the US. You can see the bottom below the dotted line, you see the patients with off pump, the more you do the patients with the higher risk, the benefit is getting better compared to the on pump. This is the big papers because it's a meta-analysis include 100 study and the patients of almost 20,000 cases. 
The conclusion is that the off pump is associated with a significant reduction in all subsidiable stroke compared with conventional cabbage. And the benefit of off pump in terms of death and my stroke are significantly related to the patient risk profile. That means the patient's risk profile is higher, off pump will show its benefit. And this is the, uh, one of the landmark papers from John Puskas, as we all know, that the higher risk of the ACS pump score, the higher the benefit of the off pump. I think everyone's seen, the, everyone's seen this. This is the papers from Professor Asai Pup and Suzuki from Shika University many years ago. This is a unique papers, I think, because it is a papers that done in the total off pump group and not compared to conventional, but uh, Professor compared with the low EF and normal EF group. And the conclusion is, is this. Off pump in low EF can be performed safely with the same quality, provided that the numbers of graphs and rate of completely vascularization must be performed, as in the patient with normal LE functions. When we have this evidence, what about the real world practice? In the US, this is the paper was uh, presented by Professor Faisal Bakin from Cleveland Clinic, uh, collecting the data from the STS uh, adult uh, cardiac surgery database with the patients over 2 million people in 1997 and 2012, with the conclusion that there's still the steady and significant decline in the use of off pump among US surgeons. 86% of off pump surgeons in US perform less than 20 cases a year, and 34% of doctors do not do any off pump at all. The decline in off pump appear to be driven mostly by the decline in high volume centers and also by the high volume surgeons. I think the curve of the US, just like in Thailand, I think, uh, the peak of the off pump was in the 2003, 2004 and getting down and coming to the plateau about 15 to 70% right now. And I heard that even in European or Germany, maybe below 10%. And on the right side of the figure showing that the the all comers conversion rate is about 6%, which is pretty high compared to the Asian countries. And going back to Asian country, this is the report from Korea Artery Surgery result in 2017 from uh, the, the survey of the Committee of the Japanese Association of Korea Artery Surgery. This is the, for me, I think it's a diff, uh, really interesting uh, figure. You can see on the left hand side, start from 2000, uh, early 2000, you see the the overall crude mortality of cabbage in Japan is around, let's say, 3.5%. And this is getting down into around, let's say, 1% in 2004 and 2005 and stable there. On the right-hand side, the figure showing that the rate of off pump in, in the early 2000 is so low, below 10%. And it keeps coming up to around 60% in 2004. That is the same time you see that the the Japanese association can reduce the mortality rate to below one, and also the increase the number of off pump is keeping higher. So I think that there must be something that we should look inside of this. And you see the crude mortality is 1.5, but initial elective cabbage is below one. And if you do off pump, it's even better. What about in Thailand? This is the data collected in last year, 2019. Actually, we do open heart surgery about 16,000 cases last, last year. And we do cabbage in total about 6,000 cases. This is a government hospital. Uh, I come from Lampang Hospital. It's the number four that we do. Off pump last year, we do 236 cases. Uh, on pump beating around six. And uh, we, we didn't do on pump cabbage last year. What about in the private sector? In but you can see that the private sector, most of them do on-pump arrested heart. Uh, Off-pump is going down, only left on the Bangkok Heart Hospital team. This is the curve of Thailand. You can see it's ups and down since 2001 and peaked the same in around 2004. At present time, I think the, the ratio is still below 12% in Thailand situation. Coming back to my hospital, in 2019, I, we did the annual report the first time in, in our unit. 
with the supporting from our fellow Japanese that stay with us. I, we, we do the total case of the cabbage around total in 2,090 case. With the isolated cabbage is 248, this is the 85%. Yeah, this is the same. The outcome rate is around 97.5% in initial elected cases. What about our mortality? Our mortality in isolated cabbage is uh, four cases, which is 1.6%. Uh, in elected cases, 1.3%. And the stroke rate is quite good, I think. We have only one case for permanent stroke, is only 0.47%, only 0.4%. And uh, we have the conversion rate is 0.9%. What about the number of nasomosis of the graph? Uh, most of the case we did triple bypass, 42%, and four graph is 27%. Uh, uh, we use a non-touch technique aorta about 50% of case. So that's why we have a lot of sequential grafting, that's 35%. Uh, we use Lima, Lima is a 90, 97%. Rima, Rima on the right is 45%, GA around 13%. So we can do the total arterial grafting in 42%. We do Sima at uh, 53 and the Bima is 44 in our center. Because bef before we come into this year, last year, what do we do routinely before we come into this? Uh, actually, in our, in our hospital, we have four attending surgeons. And up to now, four of our cardiac surgeons perform off arm everyone. So, so not just me. So we do it routinely, every day. Uh, with this practice, uh, this is really to show the environment in, in, our, in our operating theater. This is the way we do the expose of the LED. We do it uh, like we do every day, like we eat a lunch, I think. Uh, no rush, and uh, the team is quite set up now, so I'm happy about this. This is the way we do the uh, OM exposure. We do it gently and we can do almost every case like this. Uh, this video may be five or six years ago. This is my colleagues who did the OM anastomosis. This is Ms. Uh, Dr. Bunsap, she's a lady. She's a lady, but she can also perform off-arm very good in our unit without rush. So you can see off-arm, most of the case exposure is not that bad if we get used to it and adopt this technique and keep learning from experienced doctor, like we work out the supporting from Japanese association. Uh, I would like to show a bit about uh, the case that I did uh, two years ago. This is the female, 62 years old. The patient's admitted in the CCU with acute non stemi left main, EF around 40, and got a moderate to severe ischemic mitral regurgitation. And later after I got consulted, they put in the balloon pump to support her because of the MR. Uh, on the each surgery have a very tight stenosis. So actually I plan to do triple bypass with this case with arterial graft. Access is good, you can see from femoral arteries. Uh, Transesophageal echo before I make the incision still confirm that uh, there's a severe, uh, moderate to severe ischemic MR from tethering of the posterior leaflet of mitral valve. But they think that this is from the acute mitral valve regurgitation from acute MI. So I think if I can do it, mitral valve regurgitation might convert. So that's what I try to do. A couple of cases. And accidentally in this case, I have some injury to the mid part of the Lima, so I do the eye extension radio to the left internal memory artery, and I do the sequential bypass uh, OM into the LAD. Um, I made the video run a, a bit quicker for the sake of time, sorry. And on the right side, I go on to bypass with right IMA into the PDA. Uh, 
after that, I, I, I use a transit time flow measurement, and the result is uh, acceptable. Not so good, but it's good. I uh, did not let, take a record at that time. Uh, so I plan to do the CTA after this. Uh, but uh, you can see that right after we finished the operation, the, the metal recurs uh, resoluted quite very well. And the RV function is getting better. This is the X-ray of the patients two years after the operation. The heart size is getting smaller. This is the patient. I met her last week, so I took a picture. Uh, and the echo found it, no MR right now. I didn't have an official report to, to, to tell you. What about our midterm result after off-arm surgery in the patient with poor left neural function in Lampang Hospital? Uh, actually, I, I did this the report Actually, just like uh, what Professor Asai showed many, many years ago, like a kind of the copy, what, what, we had, what our result is in, the, in terms of safety and and efficacy in Lampang Hospital. And from February 2011 to October 2019, we have the total case of 1,182 cases who had the isolated cabbage by op-pump technique. So we compare the midterm result of 221 cases with poor EF mean LEF below 35, and those who are above 35 in 961 cases. The follow-up was 100% by myself. What about patient background number one? You can see that on the left, uh, LEF is quite different. Uh, on the EF below 35 is 28, and above 35 is 70. New York heart is significantly different. Background number two, regarding to the viral arrival of a uh, Territories, which is not, dif different, but not different between the two arms. Background number three, in the associate disease and euro score. So you can see what is the difference is that COPD in COPD, peripheral vascular disease, recent MI, renal failure, that's mean creating above two euro score is significantly different and higher in low ejection fraction group. What about intraoperative characteristic? Conversion rate is not different. Arterial revascularization, number of anastomosis, that include one or two vessels is about 3.4 between the group. Non-touch aorta is not different. What the, the only one that is different is the schedule for IBP. In low ejection fraction group, we put in the balloon pump more significantly. What about the outcome? 30-day mortality is not different. Force of stroke is not different. Wound infection is not different. Only dialysis is higher in group of low EF, and the hospital stay is longer. Kaplan Meyer midterm outcome survival is about 91% uh, for EF above 35, and 76% uh, in the group of below 35. About freedom from major adverse cardiac event, uh, EF above 35 is better. But anyway, it's a, the, the result is quite promising, I think. On the conclusion, off-arm surgery in patients with lower, poor LVEF in our unit can be performed safely without significant difference compared to, uh, compared to better LVEF group in terms of numbers of graph, complete revascularizations, conversion rate, early death, new stroke, sonar complication is not different. And our finding can indicate that if complete evascularization can be achieved safely by off-arm technique, poor low ejection fraction should not be an exclusion criteria. In the current era, increasing number of higher risk patients refer to bypass surgery. So off-arm remain an attractive and challenging strategy to reduce the operative mortality. These superior outcome in high risk patients can be achieved only if off-arm is routinely performed. I mean, even in the low risk case or high risk case, as the same. And this, yeah. Uh, sorry, this is the features of our team. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Nada Pong, and congratulations on your results. And congratulations on the work that you're doing there and how meticulous you are in following those patients up. So. I think, I think that's a wonderful example. Uh, questions? 
highest. Well, congratulations on your uh, pretty excellent outcome of off-form surgery on the patient with uh, poor left ventricular function. I just uh, have uh, one comment and one question. Uh, comment is um, uh, Japanese database of uh, cardiovascular surgery uh, collected uh, more than 2,000 of uh, patients with poor uh, left ventricular dysfunction. Their ejection fraction is less than 0 0.3. And they divided uh, this patient into two groups uh, done by on pump or off pump. And they also done a propensity match analysis and found off pump surgery produced a better outcome like a mortality or bleeding uh, in his uh, restaurant tony and other small comorbidities. So uh, you said that uh, off form surgeries should not be excluded from the surgery for the patients with left ventricular dysfunction. But we recommend off form surgery to the patient with poor ventricular dysfunction by this report or this by this paper in 2016. And the, my question is, your conversion rate is very, very low, very excellent. Could you tell me your tips? Actually, I, I don't know what, I think maybe related to the learning curve, I think. Tomorrow it will be one of my more talk about the evolution of my, of our unit. Uh, from Dr. Sierra that he helped me to evaluate the, the evolu evolutions. In the first uh, 750 case that we start, we divided into three, three evolutions. The numbers of mortality, or I mean morbidity increasing the conversion rate is getting low and low. In the first period, we have about 5% of conversion rate. And also coming down to two and below two, like a 0.9%. Mm -hmm. I think because we, we feel more comfortable with the technique and environment, and most important thing is that the anesthesiologist in, in my hospital is quite familiar and love to do this technique because they know that this technique gives the benefit for the patient. Like a, one, one time I, I said the patient should do on-pump arrested heart in, in, in my schedule. And then she would just call up to me that why I have to do that. So she loved and she almost supported how to do off-pump in our hospital because at least at now early and midterm result is quite satisfying. I think the, the team process and evolution is one thing that makes us better. We want to keep improving. And yeah, that, that is the thing. As you said, I just one hundred percent one hundred percent agree that uh, there is a, a learning curve period, learning period. So I'm very interested to uh, overcome that uh, learning period. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Minto Jampong, congratulations for your excellent uh, results in your center. I personally had an experience of visiting your center. Really uh, amazed at the progress you have done from 2014 to 2020. Uh, just uh, I also like to make a comment that the anesthetists are the heroes of any off form TABs, is what we feel because the more uh, comfortable anesthetist is in managing the patient, the more comfortable the surgeon is and he does not have to watch the monitor continuously while doing his anastomosis. So it's absolutely right that your uh, anesthetist is the most important person at that time along with you. Second uh, uh, one question I want to ask is how many patients or percentages you use IBP uh, for low EF patients while doing off from CABG? And did you do a preoperative viability stress for these patients, for evaluating these patients? Yeah, in, in this group of low ejection fraction rate, I always afraid of something like you said, the patient develops scar or 
that means not suitable to do the bypass. Uh, and luckily, that uh, in my area, if you send the patient to perform viability, viability test, uh, the waiting list is about one year, which is almost impossible. So anyway, I have to talk with the, our cardiologist team. We look up into everything like EKG and also the echo. Uh, he, echo. He, he, we look around, like uh, look at the thickness of the ventricle wall and uh, something, and we discuss together with the cardiologist that should we bypass it or not. We, we did not do it alone. So in this high-risk case, we, we kind of do like a heart team in our unit also. And regarding your balloon pump use? Among, about the uh, balloon pump group uh, uh, in, wait a minute. Sorry, I don't remember. It's around, they say, 37%. 37. I'm happy to you both very well. I have two questions. One is uh, the long-term results for the patient with the poor LV function depends on the viability of the myocardium. If we, and uh, I want to ask, uh, ask you about the possibility of EF improved or not. Do you have any data of the uh, LV function? I'm, I'm really sorry to answer you that uh, we don't have the protocol to, to follow up the case with the echo in every case. So most of the case I follow the patient with the clinical and uh, X-ray, like you said. And uh, what I'm going to report after that is uh, maybe graph frequency with the CTA. That's all what we can do. And the se second question is about the number of the graft. The number was uh, 3.4 for the prop every function and the 3.1 for the normal pa patient. And uh, my idea is that uh, the many, as many as possible grafting for the LV function should be better, in my opinion. And my uh, average number with the graft is 4.2 for the normal normal patient, and for the LB, for the patient with the LB, poor LV function, it might be a four and a five. So, uh, and uh, I think there are some limitation if you use the off pump for the LB, uh, poor LV function. Do you have any idea about the number with the grafting? Uh, yes, thank you very much. I think this part of thing is very important, and we in our team talk together almost every day about how to do the complete revascularization because we have a conference before surgery every day. So before we do surgery in each and every case, we discuss how many graphs we should do it in the team. Yeah. So like, uh, sadly that uh, the target visit is so bad, most of the case no. that yeah. we, yeah, yeah. So, so the number of graphs that we perform is directly to the quality of the anatomy, uh, to the quality of the anatomy that we can see from the angiogram. However, the number of completely vascularization sometimes is lower than we expect. Uh, the numbers may be, let's say, around 90% they can do completely vascularization as we plan. But, but I would I keep it up in mind and, and make the best for our patient. Thank you very much. Okay. In next session, I will uh, show uh, nine grafting for the LB, poor LV function. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Dr. Natapon. So, uh, congratulations, you are uh, definitely the leading hospital in Thailand. Thank you. So, the last presenter is uh, Hitoshi Yokoyama from Fukushima University. Safe and effective of cap indication and surgical strategy. And Dr. Yokoyama is uh, now currently the president of Japanese Society of Cardiovascular Surgery, and the 15th anniversary meeting will be held in this coming March in Fukushima. So please come to Japan. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Alai. <laughs> I must say, uh, Dr. Lai is the president of the Japanese Association of Cardiovascular Surgery. <laughs> well, um, uh, let me give it.
Okay. Thank you very much. Well, uh, this is a great privilege for me to uh, present these important topics of, uh, of form surgery uh, here in Chiang Mai. And uh, OPCAB is the uh, gold standard in Japan. And you can see 64% uh, of cabbage are going off form. Uh, it's very unique when uh, compared with other countries. Uh, there are several uh, bad scenarios in OPCAB, uh, such as uh, interoperable shock, or uh, urgent pump conversion, or uh, UPC, or uh, coronary artery injury, or post -oper perioperative cerebral infarction. Uh, today, uh, my talk will be focused on the urgent pump conversion. Uh, this is a, a nationwide survey of Japanese Association Coronary Artery Surgery uh, showing that we still have 2.9% conversion rate. And you can see the uh, mortality of cabbage. Off pump complete and on pump arrest. Uh, I mean, with cardiac arrest, uh, conventional surgery uh, shows good results. However, our conversion group showed four times high mortality than off pump complete. Uh, many risk factors for our urgent pump conversion has been reported in these decades, including surgeon's experience. Here, absolutely, uh, there is a learning period for Susan and his team. Well, me, Hawaii, um, many research uh, suggest OPCAB is recommended uh, for high risk patients. And in this case, high risk means a high risk to on pump cabbage. As you may know, Dr. Pascas clearly demonstrated OPCAB is recommended uh, for on pump cabbage, high risk patients. However, he also demonstrated that if the risk is low, we do not see any benefit of OPCAB in regard to mortality. And the majority of our patients in our practice are low risk patients. So, if we would do OPCAP only on the high risk patients, we could be an occasional OPCAP surgeon. Is this a problem? Um, tell me later. Uh, here, uh, this is an interesting recent paper by the coronary trial group. Uh, trying to uh, assess the risk factors and outcomes of uh, converted patients. They divided conversion as emergent or elective. And they found emergent conversion is associated with worse outcomes compared with electric conversion or no conversion group. In conclusion, and early and elective conversion is a wide choice. I agree with that. And in their study, conversion rate was varied from zero to 60%, very much varied among hospitals and surgical teams. And uh, there is a timing of conversion and rhythm of conversion. Uh, so this 3% of conversion were occurred during anastomosis, uh, probably in emergent fashion. 64% conversion had hemodynamics reason as hypotension, ischemia, hemorrhage, or arrhythmia. Uh, they demonstrated that conversion group had worse mortality after three days and even one year follow up with several post-operative mobilities as shown here. They found 
independent predictors for emergent conversion as follows. Heart rate more than 80, chronic atrial fibrillation, non beta blocker use, urgent surgery, and low off bomb late surgeon. In other words, occasional off cap surgeon. Uh, now, it seems to me we have two surgeon related risk factors for urgent conversion. So, um, urgent pump conversion is a bad scenario and occurs often during the learning period or occasional surgery. Uh, so, here I would like to uh, introduce our routine op cab strategy, especially for the uh, learning period or a uh, uh, surgeon or hospital who trying to start their op cab program. Um, first, uh, depending on the preoperative conditions, we choose on pump, off pump, or prophylactic IABP. Second, with a careful intraoperative monitoring, uh, we choose intraoperative IABP or unhurried elective uh, pump conversion. Our routine op cap strategy has three goals. One, to avoid uh, cardiopulmonary bypass and global cardiac ischemia if possible. Second, to prevent urgent pump conversion during opcap. And finally, to achieve complete revascularization at the end of surgery. Uh, let me explain our uh, strategy in detail. Uh, first, all patients uh, who uh, needs cabbage uh, candidates for opcap. However, the patients without stable hemodynamics, uh, such as uh, low systemic blood pressure, a recent ventricular arrhythmia, undergo on pump cabbage. All patients with stable hemodynamics undergo, I'm sorry. Well, before injection of general anesthesia with tracheal intubation, uh, patients who are not likely to tolerate the, the hypertension, uh, such as critical left main disease or poor ventricular dysfunction, are going to uh, schedule IABP. And during off pump uh, cabbage, uh, careful monitoring is necessary by anesthesiologist. Uh, patient with uh, myocardial ischemia as such as uh, ST elevation in AKG or bradycardia or uh, PVC, um, surgeon and anesthesiologist do something to fix it. And if you find the patient with uh, left ventral dysfunction, as such as with uh, pulmonary artery elevation and hypertension. And our team should uh, take uh, urgent action. So a uh, patient who has mild cardiac dysfunction should uh, go to the on pump surgery in unhurried elective fashion, not urgent. And finally, uh, all patients should have the uh, complete revascularization at the end of the surgery. And this is my favorite slide. And off pump uh, is a unique procedure uh, where the surgeon is manipulating a beating heart, which itself is maintaining the blood supply to the whole body. So it is important for the surgeon and anesthesiologist to keep a cross watch on the subtle abnormalities showing here are making best efforts to the uh, keep the beating heart within the physiological range. If we do not do so, it will be a disaster. Uh, under our strategy, conversion rate was kept being 
less than 1% during our learning period of cases. And in our learning period series, OPCAL was completed in 90-80% of the patients. Our rate of conversion was 0.6%. Uh, here I present four conversion cases uh, during the first 500 OPCAP cases. And one patient, case one, uh, suffered sudden ventricular fibrillation just after the Lima LAD anastomosis and defibrillated immediately and underwent four vessel on pump cabbage. Uh, two patients, case two and three, suffered elevated pulmonary artery pressure and systemic hypertension with an elevated ST segment on EKG after completion of anastomosis. Um, these two patients also uh, go to the on pump cabbage in, in an elective way. Uh, the first case uh, have the patient with intramyocard LAD and we found left ventricular bleeding, so uh, we electively put the patient on arm pump. All cases has uh, no mortality or morbid. And this is a video of the first case after Lita LAD anastomosis. The heart was fibrillated suddenly. Well, I tried to manipulate the heart, and uh, my assistant um, preparing the DC shocker. Uh, but he's a little bit upset, so uh, first trial is not going very well. So relax. One more time. Okay. Oh, it seems very, very long time, but it was just uh, 30 seconds. So uh, we do uh, follow the, by the on pump beating uh, cabbage and no complications. So um, good team should have uh, several tips and tricks, um, such as surgical technique and careful monitoring. Um, today, I would like to add my presentation uh, some tips of uh, intracoronary shunt. Uh, intracoronary shunt uh, is recommended especially when, uh, cramp the, when you cramp the coronary artery with a large perfusion area and less severe proximal anastomosis. I prefer um, test cramping and preconditioning with a small, gentle D3 clamp. And uh, first, uh, dissect the proximal uh, pericornite fat tissue and apply the D3 clamp and see how the ST change or hypotension might occur during test cramping. If so, release the clamp and wait for a while and one or two or three times, it's like a preconditioning. So let me show you uh, one tip uh, how to insert the intracoronal shunt quickly without minimal myocardial ischemia. Um, first coronal insertion uh, was done with a cramp and uh, Dietrich cramp was applied on the proximal coronal artery and insert the proximal end of the shunt and cramp the um, D3 cramp again to fix the uh, coronary shunt. Then uh, surgeon put the other side of the uh, shunt to the distal portion of the coronary artery. It's very easy and quick. So um, uh, there is a video. Uh, a Dietrich cramp is already there, and the proximal R of shunt is inserted and cramped, so shunt never uh, slipped away. So surgeon easily uh, put the uh, 
distal arm of the shunt into the coronary artery. So the, it may be within 10 seconds. So um, and this is my last slide, and here is a non-compete holes. I will say, I will say they keep the uh, pathological change of the heart within the physiological range and takes a good balance of working place and hemodynamics. Surgeon and anesthesiologist should keep eye on blood pressure, coronary artery pressure, uh, ST change in AKG, and I recommend easy access to IVP or pump, take it easy. Uh, finally, I uh, recommend again a uh, hurried pump conversion rather than urgent one. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Yokoyama. Very thrilling scene for the fibrillating heart. You're welcome. But you are so quiet and uh, managed very well. So, so you, you, you routinely uh, keep the, uh, the pump and engineer in the operating theater for the, I mean, besides the op op operating table, you already prepare the cardiopulmonary machine? No. 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 <laughs> They uh, can uh, make up a pump in 10 minutes. Yeah. They, are all, they are very well trained. Okay. And uh, you, do you usually uh, routinely check the transesophageal echocardiography? Yes. yes. My anesthesiologist uh, see always uh, echo, uh, trans uh, echocardiography, the cardiac function or mitral regurgitation, blah, blah, blah. So I think the mitral regurgitation is a, a kind of indicator for the uh, bad thing happening. I think so, I think so. Uh, when you uh, dislocated the heart to see the uh, circumflex, uh, it's occasional happened, uh, or uh, sometimes we can see the mitral regurgitation happened. So uh, it depends on the severity of the mitral regurgitation. Mm -hmm. It might be better time for you to go on pump. And how about the Swangans catheter? You you routinely uh, no, monitor the pulmonary artery pressure? Yeah, I, I understand the uh, use of uh, Swangans catheter in heart surgery is controversial. Maybe it's too much. But I think it's very useful. When I, uh, I always show you uh, two cases, a um, little bit hypotension and elevated pulmonary artery pressure is a sign of left ventricular oh. dysfunction, I believe. So it's okay. very quite uh, useful for us. Okay, so the high pulmonary artery pressure is a, is a bad sign for, for the deterioration of the hemodynamics. Yes, bad sign, I guess. Yes. Okay. So is there any comment or maybe Dr. Nutapon, do you have any any comment for the management of interoperative management of avoid conversion or? Thank you very much, Professor Arai. I think my early experience, I have trouble with conversion like Professor Yokoyama said, and my conversion is so late. And the patient in my early experience uh, suffer even death in every case, two or three cases. But in a couple of years that we practice now, uh, if the patient just has something like a blood pressure drop or something, just conversion early, that is true, but not, not uh, much case. Actually, I have a really bad experience also when I go to help my, my young surgeon did the operation and the, the patient's got fibrillate. Uh -huh. And even I do conversion, the patient did not come back, even mm -hmm. or go on the ECMO. So that is really bad experience. So mm. right after that, I, I think I might pay particular attention to the patients more and environment in the OR is very important. One of the easy solving problem in my institution, in my OR, is that temperature is quite very bad mm. to control. Mm. And right. patients right. got this fibrillate quite easy. So would that my anesthesiologists uh, care about this, like I said, 
We try everywhere to control, but, uh, but uh, temperature inside the room better now, so we, we run the program quite smoothly. Mm -hmm. And also I run the Ten Commandments, like Professor Alai said to me. Uh, we have to have everything in OR prepared, like balloon pump, TTFM, and in this year we start to do the aperiodic ultrasound in almost every case also. So everything that we should prepare, I think our team try to do as the commandment that you teach us, that we really do it. Thank you. So yeah, I agree. So that, that no, no, normalize the temperature is uh, one of the very important yes. issues. Very important. Yeah. Is there any tips in your operating theater for to keep a uh, patient uh, temperature? Do, do you have a do you have a warmer more for for the patient? It's lay down on the bed, right? Uh, warmer. Yeah, warmer. Uh, warm. Very warm. And uh, also, uh, carbon dioxide blower should be used to uh, get a clear view, and we use a warm saline. Uh huh. If you use a normal saline, it, the cool should be uh, directly uh, make it warm. Of the uh, heart should be going down. It's it's dangerous. Mm. And uh, uh, one more comment: uh, if if the uh, defibrillation uh, does not work, you should um, <laughs> manipulate the heart, <laughs> heart <laughs> to try to uh, keep the um, patient pressure. Yeah, I, I just one did the uh, five minutes and the uh, five minutes manipulation or compression of the o open heart and uh, uh, blood pressure rated 60 millimeter mercury and he goes to on pump and it's okay. Uh -huh. So the five minutes is a kind of a critical time period. Maybe. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, so if there's any, any more Questions, so, uh, uh, Dr. Takemura. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Yokohama. Regarding the IAB, IABP, uh, uh, in my experience, uh, uh, IAB, IABP is not always safe, and I prefer the pump rather than the IABP for the bad deterioration of the hemodynamics. You use the uh, 22% of IVP on the op op care you used. My in the, in the first, first, uh, first 100 cases, right? All right, okay. Yeah, maybe. So my uh, preference is uh, just convert uh, on the, onto oh, the okay. on, on pump PT rather sure. than the IVP usage. Mm -hmm. I think the, the, num the percentage of the usage of the IVP, uh, like you, is not so uh, common. Uh, for Common in Japan at all anymore? Yeah, uh, Dr. Takemura, you you are you're true. And intraoperative, as concerned as intraoperative IVP, we do not use that. Yeah, device. We just use a scheduled IVP beforehand, and we do not uh, use the intraoperative uh, IVP right now. So even for the scheduled IVP, I prefer. Pump rather than IVP. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, but uh, you prefer scheduled IVP rather than uh, on pump beating. Okay. Okay. I will respect you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Another question. Last question. Uh, uh, we are doing around the 500 CABGs at our center unit a year. Of that, we are doing 90 to 95 percent of patients off pump, mm -hmm. and five percent of patients are doing on pump, which we are doing relatively elective on pump rather than going for crashes. Because uh, the main thing of those things is we have to do complete revascularize. That's the goal. Right. Th that's exactly. the first and the only goal we have in the first thing. And second thing is patient safety. So uh, two indicators which we do after doing a sternotomy and opening the pericardium is see the RA color, how full is the RA, and whether the RA is beating or not along with the RV and LV. If the RA is not beating and the PA is tight, those are poor patients to tolerate an off-pump CABG. So we think those, those patients, we go for an elective on-pump. The perfusionist sets up the pump. Until that time, we go for the harvesting the mammaries, harvesting of the radials. We are ready with the Y. Till that time, the perfusionist is ready with the pump. Mm. And we go ahead and do the distress. 
that's one indicator. Second thing, instead of the Dietrich's clamps, we use the Yakub's sharp clips. Yakub's. Yakub's mm -hmm. sharp clips, in which uh, we just have to uh, puncture the myocardium, so it's no, there is no chance of injuring the uh, coronary artery uh -huh. uh, with the Dietrich clamps. Okay. And instead of putting the bulldog proximally, we put it distally, mm -hmm. de the bulldog completely, and then put it proximally, then remove the uh, Yakub's clamp. Mm -hmm. And before putting, uh, doing an arteriotomy, after exposing the whole artery, we put the bulldog clamp, uh, uh, the Yakub's clamp proximally, give a uh, ischemia to the heart, and see the how the heart behaves. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, if it is doing okay, after say around half a minute, we remove it, wait for 15 seconds, again put the clamp in, uh -huh. and then do an arteriotomy and put the shunt. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, comment. Okay, thank you very much. So this time, so, so then very nice discussion, the end of the session. Thank you very much.